And the complexity of emotion and trauma is part of being human, of being alive. Horrors of the past manifest in the future, and our greatest hope must be in each other. Let us learn from each other, share in each other's grief and celebration, and build each other up. I thank you for being here tonight and for joining us as we celebrate a great American novelist and begin anew our journey toward greater understanding. So let us begin this evening and begin our education by welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Keith Byerman. Dr. Byerman earned his PhD in American Studies from Purdue University, and he has taught at ISU for nearly 35 years. An author and editor himself, Dr. Byerman specializes in African American, Southern, and modern American literature. He has served as an officer of the Toni Morrison Society, and in addition to sharing his expertise and enthusiasm with us this evening, he has also loaned us his personal collection of Toni Morrison books, which are on display in the rear of the room. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Byerman. front of a group of people without a mask. Uh, so if I look disoriented every once in a while, don't worry, it's, it's okay. Um, before I begin, uh, could Sarah and the director please come up? Uh, I have, uh, I noticed in the flyer uh, that was used to advertise this event that it talked about the audience being people 19 and older. And that, for me, that gave new meaning to the idea of the big read, right? It's for big people. <laughs> uh, well, it seemed to me that there ought to be a little read. Uh, so I am donating to the library uh, a set of children's books written by Morrison and her son Slade. Uh, and I hope that we can have a little read sometime. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I want to begin with a couple of sort of personal connections uh, with Toni Morrison. Um, and interestingly enough, these both have to do with cigarettes. Um, the second event uh, occurred in New York City uh, where there was a gala event. I should say that the Toni Morrison Society is a, an interesting combination of a serious literary organization and a fan club. And when they do Morrison stuff, they do it in style. Uh, so for her 70th birthday, uh, there was a gala dinner uh, on the ground floor of the New York Public Library, the one with the big lions outside. Um, and my job as treasurer of the society at that point was to escort Morrison from the place of the dinner where there were presentations by various people like Oprah and the president of Random House and you know all kinds of luminaries and so forth. Um, 
And so once that was all over, uh, I was supposed to take her upstairs where they had a very large cake and there was going to be dancing. Uh, she said, before we go upstairs, could we go outside? She needed a cigarette. So I took her outside. She smoked. We had this nice conversation about sort of all the people at the dinner and all of this sort of thing. Um, and then we went up to the party upstairs. The first event uh, happened on this on the ISU campus back in 1988. Uh, Morrison was invited uh, for the dedication of Root Hall. Uh, I don't know if you know Root Hall. It's the building next to the Shriner, just north of the Shriners building, across the street from what used to be the university school. Um, and it's, you can't miss it, it's the building with the blue metal roof. Why in the world it has a blue metal roof, I have no idea, uh, but it does. So Morrison was here for that event. Um, and it's a suggestion of how long ago this was because Morrison did a book signing down in the main hallway, what was intended to be an atrium uh, of the building, uh, and all these people, you know, bought copies, brought copies of her novels and so forth, and she autographed them, and smoked nonstop while she was doing it. Um, then, I seem to have this job, wherever I am, of being Toni Morrison's escort. Uh, so uh, I was assigned responsibility for taking her back to the airport. Um, and a professor from the communications department wanted to join us and talk more to Morrison uh, using this opportunity. So Morrison sits in the back seat and the two of us are in the front. She is only the second person ever to smoke in one of my cars. Uh, so for some reason, whenever I see, and she smokes Marlboros. She smoked Marlboros, by the way, in case anybody wants to know the details. And boy, do I know those details. Uh, all right. Uh, at that event, that dedication, um, Beloved had come out the year before, and Morrison was asked to do a reading over in the new theater. And the place was packed, uh, because there had been a lot of advertising of this. Uh, there were a lot of donors from the university that were invited. There were uh, alumni who came and so forth. Uh, room was filled. It was more or less theater in the round. Um, and Morrison sat down uh, on the stage and everything was totally silent for an hour as she read from Beloved. The audience was overwhelmed not only by what she was saying, but by her very voice. Uh, so um, I think that, you know, I've done, uh, you know, I've been associated, uh, as was said, with Morrison material and with Morrison for something like 35 years. One of my first published articles uh, was on Morrison's The Bluest Eye, which is our first novel. Um, so, uh, 
I have a lot of experience with both her and her writing uh, that I want to talk a little bit about uh, this evening. All right, but uh, in case you need a title uh, for this. Um, Morrison was born on the 18th of February, uh, 1931, in Lorraine, Ohio, to Rama and George uh, Walford, uh, both from the South. Uh, George was from Georgia, uh, which makes it easy to remember, and Rama was from Alabama. Um, Tony was their second child, and she was named Chloe Ardelia. Now, if you go to Wikipedia, they will tell you that her birth middle name was Anthony. That is wrong. Okay, Ardelia was the name of her grandmother. She was named for her grandmother. All right, uh, her father, um, as a young man, uh, probably witnessed uh, the lynchings of two black businessmen. According to Morrison, he never talked about this, but she was convinced that he had seen that event and that was one of the reasons uh, that he moved north. Uh, he moved to Lorraine uh, to work in the foundry for U.S. Steel uh, as a welder uh, and did various odd jobs. Uh, Rama was a housewife. Uh, they had a total of four children, with Chloe being the second. Uh, she liked to tell a story about uh, the landlord that they had at the time. Uh, this is their home, by the way, in, in Lorraine. Uh, and they had diff often had difficulty making the rent because uh, black men, even working in steel mills and so forth, uh, received lower wages uh, than white men, uh, in part because they could not join unions. Uh, the unions were segregated. Uh, so uh, they had trouble often making the rent. Well, the landlord, rather than simply evict them, set his own house on fire uh, to get them out of there. Uh, and that never quite made sense to me, but, you know, Landlords can be strange people. Um, and Morrison, what Morrison does recall from that event is that the family, instead of being frightened and uh, disturbed by this, simply laughed in the face of the landlord uh, and found another place to live. Um, Morrison was raised in the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, where her mother was uh, a devout member. Uh, but Chloe uh, converted to Catholicism at the age of 12, something that people, I think, also don't know much about. And she took Anthony as her saint's name, thus becoming Tony. Uh, it is sometimes said that naming is destiny. Saint Anthony of Padua is the patron saint of lost things. Morrison's work can be said to be about that which is lost. People, identity, values, St. Anthony was also famous as a teacher and preacher. Uh, two elements we can also 
think about Morrison in terms of. Okay. Uh, one of the ways I think she became uh, the kind of person she was was her success on the high school debating team where she learned how to construct arguments and, and make her case and, and so forth. Um, she attended Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, graduating in 1953. Then she went to Cornell University for a master's degree, granted in 1955. After that, she taught at Texas Southern University in Houston, which is another uh, African-American university. Uh, and after a couple of years uh, at Texas Southern, uh, she returned to teach at Howard. And at Howard, she met and married uh, Harold Morrison, uh, a man originally from Jamaica and also an instructor uh, at the university. They had two sons, Harold and Slade, uh, and were divorced in 1964, though she kept his, his name. Um, and it was while she was at Howard that she decided to be Tony, that she began going by that name rather than Chloe. Uh, so she, con she constructed an identity for herself. Right. Um, she began working as, after she graduated, began working for Random House. Uh, first as uh, a textbook editor in Syracuse, and then as an editor in the fiction division in New York City. Um, she focused on uh, African-American uh, writers and activists. Uh, she is responsible for publications by Huey Newton, Angela Davis, Muhammad Ali, uh, and three writers you may or may not uh, have heard of, but you really should find their works and read them. Uh, Tony Bambara, Leon Forrest, and Gail Jones. Uh, she also developed uh, the Black Book, uh, which is a collection of hi black historical materials. There, there's a copy of the Black Book in the, in the case back there. Uh, it's been newly issue, reissued uh, it originally came out in the mid-1970s. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating book in terms of, sort of what she decided to do. What she did was gather newspaper story, stories, uh, legends, uh, various kinds of materials in this book, and then sort of jammed all the pages together. Um, and in doing the work for the Black Book, uh, she found the story of Margaret Garner, uh, who was the inspiration for the novel Beloved. Right. While doing this day work, she began working on her own writing. Now, you have to keep in mind that she was uh, a single parent, raising two boys, uh, largely on her own, uh, living in New York City, which is not a, which even then was not an inexpensive place uh, to live. Uh, but she began starting her own writing. Uh, she had, when she was at Howard, written a short story uh, about a girl, a young black girl who wants to have, more than anything in life, blue eyes. Um, and this story emerged into her first novel, uh, The Bluest Eye, which came out in 1970. I would point out that she was 39 years old uh, when she published this 
So if you are an aspiring writer and you feel like, you know, it's never going to happen, 39. You, guys, you still got time, okay, uh, to get all of this uh, together. Um, when she started, she, wrote, uh, she regularly produced uh, novels. This is where Lorraine is located. That, that is Lake Erie. Um, in The Bluest Eye, one of the male characters uh, works on the boats that would carry um, iron ore, and finish the finished steel uh, along the lake uh, and would be gone for weeks and often months at a time. Uh, so she did make use of sort of some of this kind of material. All right. Um, this is Morrison with her two sons, Harold and Slade. And this is the first novel, The Bluest Eye, uh, 1970. And this, I believe, is the cover of the original version of the novel. Um, all right. This is a, a list of her novels. Um, and one of the things I'd like to point out in this list um, is that there's a kind of consistency in her production. Um, that um, she produces a new novel about every four, five, sometimes six years, uh, depending on the level of difficulty. And this was, she did this for 40 years. So again, if you're an aspiring writer, you can go on and on and on and on. All right. Um, now, one of the things that she did not do, and she would talk to her students at these various universities that she taught at over her career. Um, she would tell them, counter to what most creative writing instructors say. Uh, I don't care about your little lives. She was something of a diva. Uh, I don't care about your little lives. Write about what's important. Uh, writing, writing instructors tend to say, write out of your own experience. Morrison said, nonsense. Find the things that are important. Find the stories. Find the history and write about that. All right. Um, her themes uh, over this period of time uh, are related consistently, fairly consistently to black life. Uh, most of her novels have a very limited number of white characters. This was one of the distinctions of Morrison. Uh, there's, there was a tendency up to this time, the 1970s, uh, to always have a significant, a large number of white characters. Uh, I mean, when we look at people like Richard Wright and, and James Baldwin and Ralph Ellison, uh, as three of the major writers from the mid uh, 20th century, uh, they were fairly consistent in using a significant number of white writers. Morrison's work is about black communities and black lives. Right? But she covered not only racism, but also class differences within the black communities and colorism, uh, a term uh, which is associated with social differences among African Americans based on skin tone. 
the closer you were to being white according to this ideology, which is what it really is, uh, the better you were, the more intellectual you were, the more sophisticated you were, and so forth. Morrison plays with that idea. She doesn't buy it, but she talks about characters who do buy it and how that's important to them. Uh, right. And she seldom represents in her, her book uh, direct racial violence. Uh, that is not uh, a crucial aspect of her writing. Um, In 1983, uh, she left the publishing world uh, to spend full time on her writing. Uh, she saw this as a risk. Uh, and because up until that time, remember by 1980, if you look at this list, by 1983 she had published four, no uh, four novels. Uh, which were critical successes. They weren't always bestsellers. Well, they weren't bestsellers until uh, Oprah got hold of them. And these four novels uh, became part of Oprah's book club. And Morrison suddenly went from, you know, a sort of middle level writer in terms of commercial sales to a bestseller. Uh, just by the power of Oprah. Uh, I've got an Oprah story I can tell you sometime too, uh, if you're interested. All right. Um, she supported herself and her sons uh, by teaching at uh, the State University of New York and at Rutgers while she was working on Beloved. Um, the novel was published in 1987. It was a bestseller, uh, and it was a critical success. Uh, and I'd like us to listen to now uh, what, I hope, what I hope is uh, the opening to uh, Beloved, read by Morrison. One, two, four. Full of a baby's venom. The women in the house knew it, and so did the children. For years, each put up with the spite in his own way. But by 1873, Sasha and her daughter, Denver, were its only victims. The grandmother, Baby Sally, was dead, and the sons, Howard and Bugler, had run away by the time they were 13 years old. As soon as merely looking in a mirror shattered it, that was the signal for Bugler. As soon as two tiny handprints appeared in the cake, that was it for Howard. Neither boy waited to see more. Another kettle full of chickpeas smoking in a heap on the floor. Soda crackers crumbled and strewn in a line next to the door sill. Nor did they wait for one of the relief periods, the weeks, months even, when nothing was disturbed. No, each one said at once, the moment the house committed what was for him, the one insult not to be born or witnessed the second time. Within two months of dead winter, leaving your grandmother, baby son, and their little sister Denver all by themselves in the great white house on the Rotondo. It didn't have another Denver because Cincinnati didn't stretch that far. In fact, Ohio had been calling itself a state only 70 years when first one brother and then the next stuck a quilt passing into his hat, snatched up his shoes, and crept away from the lively spite the house. Baby Sub didn't even raise her head. From her sick bed, she heard the slow, but that wasn't the reason she lay still. It was a wonder to her that her grandsons had waited so long to realize that every house wasn't like the one on Blue Stone Road. The 
suspended between the nastiness of life and the meanness of the dead. She couldn't get interested in people or living, let alone the fright of two creeping off boys. Her past had been like her present, intolerable. And since she knew death was in a bus to gasoline, she used the little energy left to her for pondering color. Would you bring a little laughter in if you've got any? Please, you don't. And Sessa would oblige her with anything from fabric to her own. Winter in Ohio was especially rough if you had an appetite for color. Sky provided the only drama. And counting on the systematic horizon, a life's principal joy was reckless indeed. So Cecil and the girl did what they could and what the house permitted for her. Together they waged a perfunctory battle against the outrageous behavior of that place, against turning over flock jars, spats on the behind, and gusts of sour air. For they understood the source of the outrage as well as they knew the source. Baby son died shortly after the brothers left, with no interest whatsoever in their leave taking or hers. And right afterwards, Sepha and Denver decided to end the persecution by calling forth the ghost that tried them so. Perhaps a conversation, they thought. An exchange of views or something would help. So they held hands and said, come on, come on. You may as well just come on. The sideboard took a step forward, but nothing else did. Grandma baby must be stopping it, said Denver. She was 10 and still mad at baby subs for dying. Sepha opened her eyes. I doubt that, she said. Well, then why don't it come? You're forgetting how little it is, said her mother. She wasn't even two years old when she died. Too little to understand, too little to talk much, even. Maybe she don't want to understand, said Denver. Maybe, but if she'd only come, I could make it clear to her. Setha released her daughter's hand, and together they pushed the sideboard back against the wall. Outside, a driver whipped his horse into the gallop local people felt necessary when they passed 124. For a baby, she throws a powerful spell, said Denver. No more powerful than the way I loved her, Setha answered. And there it was. I think you get a sense from that of why an audience would just sit in absolute silence uh, while she was speaking. Um, so an amazing voice telling an amazing story. All right. Um, the novel caused some controversy uh, when it did not win either the National Book Award or the Critics Circle Award uh, the year it came out. Uh, and a group of uh, 45 prominent African American writers and critics uh, wrote a letter of protest. Uh, this group included people like Maya Angelou. Um, it did, however, win the Pulitzer Prize that year. Um, in, six years later, uh, Morrison wins the Nobel Prize in Literature. Uh, and there is, in the case back there, uh, a copy of her Nobel Prize speech, uh, a book that everyone should have a copy of if you're serious about literature. All right. Um, in 1997, she takes a position back at Cornell University, where she had gotten her master's degree. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, she became good friends with Oprah Winfrey and was on her show a number of times. And Oprah was busy promoting uh, Morrison's book and got books. And in fact, got, as I'll point out in a minute, 
even more involved with Morrison uh, later on. Um, there is an opera entitled Margaret Garner on which she collaborated with the composer Richard Daniel Poor. Uh, and that was completed in 2002 and premiered in Detroit in 2005. Um, from 1989 to her retirement in 2006, uh, Morrison also taught at Princeton University uh, in the creative writing program. And this is where she told her students, uh, I don't want to hear about your little lives. Tell me something important. Uh, during this period, uh, she also began writing children's books uh, with her son Slade. Uh, who died in 2010 of pancreatic cancer. Uh, and it's one of the periods where uh, Morrison stopped writing for an extended period. Uh, and has talked in interviews about how she felt lost without, uh, without Slade. Um, But she did return to writing uh, and came out with two more novels. Um, she died of complications from pneumonia uh, on August 5th, 2019. Uh, and has, and her book, Beloved, that we'll be talking about more, um, was named by the New York Times as um, the most important book of the past 25 years. Uh, probably longer than that now. Uh, okay. Um, some background about Beloved. Um, It is based on something she found, as I mentioned, in research for the Black Book. Uh, the story of Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner was born in Kentucky. Uh, she was married to Robert Garner, uh, who was also a slave, uh, in, in 1849. And they had four children. Um, in 1856, uh, while she was pregnant, uh, Margaret, with her family, crossed the Ohio River to Cincinnati. Uh, the reason they could do this is that that was an especially cold winter and the Ohio River froze over. So they basically could walk across the river. Uh, they traveled with a large group of at least 17 people. Uh, most of whom uh, were able to get connected almost immediately to the Underground Railroad, uh, and almost all of them uh, managed to reach Canada and freedom. Uh, slave catchers went after them almost immediately uh, and quickly caught up with them uh, at the place they were hidden. Um, and during this confrontation, um, Margaret killed her two-year-old daughter, Mary. Um, the reason that she did this, uh, she would explain later, uh, was that she did not want her daughter to, be, to grow up a young woman in slavery. Um, and there are reasons that I'll get to in just a second about that, uh, for that. Uh, this was all possible because of the Fugitive Slave Act, which was passed in 1850, which allowed slave masters or their agents to pursue fugitive slaves, those who had escaped, anywhere in the United States. Uh, so even though Margaret uh, 
and Robert uh, were from Kentucky and got, had gotten to the free state of Ohio. Nonetheless, their master had the right to engage in what the police call hot pursuit. Uh, and uh, they managed to capture them. Um, Margaret's intention was to eventually, was to kill all of her children, but she didn't have time. She only, there was only the one. Um, there was a court trial uh, that had an interesting issue. The question was, state law, does state law override the Fugitive Slave Act? Once they had arrived in Ohio, by Ohio law, they were free. But according to the Fugitive Slave Act, which was federal law, uh, they were simply property. Uh, and uh, this is the publication of, of Beloved. Uh, this is a painting by Thomas Satterwhite Noble from 1867 of Margaret Garner. Um, right. uh, and so uh, one side, the, uh, the defense argued that state law was prominent and that Margaret should in fact be tried for murder because that would make her a person not a possession. The judge decided in favor of the prosecution, which argued that federal law superseded state law, and therefore that uh, Mr. Garner had the right to his property and to return his property to a slave state. And that's, in fact, what happened. Uh, so Margaret and Robert are returned to Kentucky. Uh, they are transported to another plantation in Arkansas and later to New Orleans. Um, and Margaret died in 1858 uh, in the typhoid fever epidemic in New Orleans. All right. Um, that's what Morrison does is take that core story, and if you look at uh, the selection from the uh, from the Black Book, you'll see that is a couple of short columns. It's about uh, five or six inches. Uh, of newspaper space. Uh, that was the story. And then it was accompanied, in some cases it was accompanied by uh, this, this was uh, originally a painting that became, it was used as a lithograph. Um, all right. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about adaptations of Beloved before I go into talking about ways to read the novel. Uh, it's important to understand what is meant by an adaptation. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be having a couple of showings of the movie uh, during this big read uh, at this library and the one uh, and the West Library. Uh, an adaptation is the taking of a work and developing it for another medium. Okay. And what's important is that it has to follow the rules of the new medium. So you are not going to, so you're not going to get exactly the same thing. Uh, in both versions. A novel is much too long to have every word of it 
reproduced uh, on a theater screen. It simply can't be done. It would be probably about a week-long film if you tried to do that. Um, you have to fit it within the framework of a film or in the other case, fit it into the framework of an opera. And the question is, how well does it do that? This is the evaluation question. The question is not, is it exactly the same? Does it leave out stuff? Because of course it does. Uh, it's how well does it capture the sense of the original? All right. So in 1998, uh, the movie Beloved uh, was uh, released, directed by Jonathan Demme, uh, and starring the ever-present Oprah Winfrey, uh, who was one of the producers, uh, Danny Glover, and Tandy Newton. Uh, and it was not a commercial success. Uh, and the sense was that people did not want to spend two hours watching a very depressing movie, uh, a movie in which a mother kills her child and then bad things happen. Uh, all right. People just didn't want to watch that. No, at least that was the theory. Uh, but the film is still out there. You can find copies of it. Uh, then in 2005, uh, Morrison wrote the libretto uh, and Richard Daniel Poor wrote the music for Margaret Garner, uh, the opera. I think I've got, yes. Um, all right, let's play a bit from the opera. Because we don't think of novels as being converted into opera, so I want to see if we can
All right. Um, let me finish up by suggesting a few ideas for reading the novel. Uh, first of all, you have to understand this is a difficult novel. And I don't mean that it's difficult in terms particularly of its structure or its vocabulary, uh, those kinds of things that we often think of in terms of difficulty. Uh, it is an emotionally difficult novel. Um, it took me four times to get past the first 15 pages of this book. Um, because it was like, I can't do anymore. I can't deal with this. Once, however, I overcame that because I had to teach the book. I couldn't stop reading it. Uh, it was, I guess that's the last one of these. Um, so you need to be aware of that. Okay. A uh, couple of things that might be helpful. First of all, Morrison is very, Morrison is one of those people who is a very careful artist. Nothing in her work is by accident. One of the things she is famous for are the opening lines of her books. Uh, the novel Paradise. Uh, go back here to the list. Uh, opens with the line, first they killed the white girl. Now, we have no context for that line. Who is they? And who is the white girl? And we, in fact, in that novel, never learn which of the women was the white girl. Three things in this book as part of the opening of it. The dedication is to 60 million and more. And a lot of people have puzzled over that dedication. What 60 million? And as some of us have pointed out, and I wasn't the first, but there, a number of others did, and I, I certainly agree with them. Uh, it is an echo and an expansion of the Holocaust, the six million. Uh, historical estimates, depending on what exactly it is you are counting, uh, suggests that somewhere between 10 and 100 million Africans died over the 400 year period of the Atlantic slave trade uh, as a direct result of the slave trade. Okay. You get the higher figure if you incorporate uh, the wars that were encouraged by the Europeans in Africa uh, so that people would be captured uh, and brought to uh, the forts along the coast of Africa uh, and transported to the west. Then there were the millions who died in what's known as the Middle Passage, the transportation of those people in ships 
especially designed to carry bodies across the Atlantic Ocean. Ships, by the way, that were built by uh, people in New England, and often the captains were from New England. Uh, and so when people talk about you know, slavery and racism being a southern issue, that's another lie of history. All right. So 60 million is a kind of middle ground number here. But I think she chooses it specifically because of the implication of the Holocaust. All right. And then, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. One of the things I try to teach my students in African American literature classes is the importance of knowing the Bible. Uh, this is from Romans, chapter 9, verse 25. And then we have, as we heard Morrison read, um, 124 was spiteful, full of a baby's venom. The women in the house knew it, and so did the children. Right. What is 124? And how can it be spiteful? And what is a baby's venom? Snakes have venom, not babies. Morrison seeks, as, seeks in the very beginning of her work to send us into mysteries. All right, so I'm not going to tell you how to read Beloved. I'll give you some suggestions for how you, it, you might make sense for yourself of the book. One way to read it is as a ghost story. Because we are told that there is a ghost in the house. We are told that 124 is haunted Um, it can be read as a horror story. Um, terrible things happen. Not just to Setha, but to the men in the story, for example. Who, by the way, are largely ignored in the movie. It can be read as a slave narrative. Uh, a genre of literature that came about um, in the pre-Civil War period as ways in which those who managed to escape slavery told their stories, in part to encourage and inspire uh, the anti-slavery movement. There was another set of uh, slave narratives that were created during the uh, New Deal. And Rosetta Haynes can tell you about some of those. Uh, people went around and interviewed those who had been slaves. Uh, and in some cases managed to uh, escape, or after freedom managed to get someplace else. There was a lot of movement. Um, and then there are what are now known as neo-slave narratives. That is, very modern works, contemporary works by a number of African American writers uh, about uh, the experience of slavery. 
the most famous of these is, of course, uh, Alex Haley's Roots. Uh, but one can think of Beloved as another version of that kind of story. One can think of it as a family saga. This is the story of three generations, primarily three generations of women, uh, and how they survive or don't survive uh, the world in which they live. And finally, in contradiction to much of what I just said, uh, it can be read as a love story. Paul D., one of the men, um, says to Sepha, you, you, your own, you your best thing, Sepha, you are. His holding fingers are holding hers. And she responds, me? Me? Paul D., who comes back after many years, learns Seth's story, is nearly driven crazy by it, uh, and then comes back to her. Unfortunately for the love story, Morrison has an added chapter, a kind of epilogue, in which she says, it was not a story to pass on. And we need to think about what she means by pass on. I mean, our common sense reading of that is it's not a story to tell other people. It's not a story that you keep repeating. But I would suggest there's another way. It's not a story to let go of. It's a story to keep, to treasure. Um, so, those are all simply suggestions for ways to engage a very complex, disturbing, uh, brilliant novel. Thank you. This is where we have the Q&A. Are there any questions for Dr. Byron? Oh, come on. <laughs> yes, Rosetta. <laughs> I'm not planning to vote. The famous Rosetta Haynes. <laughs> um, oftentimes when I read a book, um, I will notice things that I didn't the first time around or the second time around. And it'll be like, wow, why didn't I, why didn't I notice that before? Um, and I think gifted writers are able to do that for its readers to help us find layers of meaning and, and things that we don't notice the first or second or third time around. Um, are there things that you noticed after reading this novel multiple times? I'm one of those people who moves around when I teach classes and do talks and so forth. Um, all right. Um, a, few year, a number of years ago, uh, Morrison was speaking up at Purdue. Uh, and I 
got a group of students and we went up to hear the, her, her talk. And we stand, had to stand at the back of the hall because it was packed by the time we got there. Um, and a young woman, at the end of it, Morrison took a, did a Q&A. And a young woman came up to the audience mic and said, now, the character Beloved, she's just a ghost, right? That's what she is. Nothing else, just a ghost. And Morrison said, you're very young, aren't you? <laughs> you don't read much, do you? Had that look in her eyes. Um, said, beloved is what we make of the character. Whatever that is, whatever you need her to be, it's, she is not necessarily one thing. People have suggested, for example, that the character beloved is the symbol of all of those who perished uh, in the Middle Passage. Uh, one of the things that is that we learn is that Beloved became pregnant. Um, what does that mean? Uh, and it's very, it's very disturbing in the film because Tandy Newton plays, uh, plays Beloved. And at one point, she comes out onto the porch of 124 completely naked and pregnant. What's going on there? What, is the, what are the implications of that pregnancy? One of the things that interests me, and the more I think about it, the more I think needs to be engaged with this. Uh, so I said, in the making of the movie, they virtually ignore the men in the movie. There are these five men who are slaves, and there is Setha as the only female slave on the Garner plantation. Um, those men, I mean, horrible things happen to those men. They go through traumas. There is a character named Sixo who falls in love with a woman that he calls the 30 mile woman. Because it is 30 miles back and forth to the plantation she lives on. And he goes, he leaves as soon as they're done in the fields and he's back in the fields in the morning and he goes to see her. And when they kill him, he starts shouting out, 7 0, 7 0. He has a son, he has someone to carry on. Okay, so I think one of the things that the next time I have a chance to teach this novel, because again, it takes a huge amount of time to teach this novel. I could see this novel taking an entire semester to teach. Um, one of the things that I think is important to recognize in Morrison is the way in which she engages male characters. 
And I've become more and more convinced of the importance of that, uh, especially in reading this book. And with Paul D. coming back and simply saying, you are your own best thing. Uh, Paul D., who can't for a long time get over the fact that she has murdered her child. Okay. The other question that I don't know the answer to yet is how are we to take the killing of a child? Remember, Morrison was Catholic. One way to think about what Setha does, especially after Beloved arrives, is a kind of penance, making up for her sin of killing her child. But isn't it the right thing to do? If that child lives, she is likely, not might be, likely to be sexually assaulted. Margaret Garner, most of Margaret Garner's children were probably the result of rape by her master. Even after she was married to Robert. Okay. How do we deal with that dilemma? And it's the question I can't figure out a tidy answer to. And so when we raise that question in class, and we always do, I have to sort of hope that someone has something thoughtful to say. So I can suggest things. I can say, OK, think about the options. What I've discovered is that I have to leave that if I try to come up with a fully acceptable, reasonable answer to that question, I would go insane. Because there is no answer to that question. What do you want for your child? Well, we know what people want for their children, or we hope we know what people want for their children. But what about nobody faces a circumstance like that? Slave women did every day. So what's to be done? How are we to judge something like that? Okay. Other questions? Is that sort of an answer? Thank you. So I think at this time, let's thank Dr. Byerman, but know that you're welcome to come up and ask a question one on one um, at the end of the event. Thank you.
We certainly have a complex novel this year with many moral dilemmas. And um, I'm not sure we can dedicate an entire semester to Beloved, uh, but we are dedicating two months to our big read this year. So know that throughout March and April, um, you can make your way through this novel and attend a variety of different programs related to the novel. Um, there are copies of the book in the back, as well as copies of the library's programming guide that gives a taste of some of the events that are happening over the course of the next two months. So thank you so much for coming and for being willing to tackle some of these difficult things that prove to us that life is not black and white, that it's all lived in different shades of gray, and we all have many of our own challenges um, that we attempt to grapple with day to day. So thank you so much. Engage with each other, engage with Dr. Byerman. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>